Our Hebrew scripture lesson this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and the breath of his lips shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf, the lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The 11th century French sage and rabbi known as Rashi insists that we read the promises in the 11th chapter of Isaiah in light of the preceding chapters. In the first chapter of Isaiah, God pronounced that the covenant people were a rebellious and sinful nation, laden with iniquity, that they had offsprings who do evil, children who deal corruptly, and they had forsaken the Lord and despised the Holy One of Israel. They were utterly estranged. In Isaiah's 10th chapter, verses 1 through 2, it pronounces, Ah, you who have iniquities, iniquitous decrees, who write oppressive statutes to turn aside the needy from justice and to rob the poor of my people of their right, that widows may be your spoil and that you may have the orphans as your prey. Now, obviously, God was angry. And because of the people's iniquities, sins of injustice and oppression of others, God gave the northern kingdom of Israel and other cities of Judah into the hands of the Assyrians. Now, I know that it goes against our Christian sensibilities to think of an angry or wrathful God. Yet when we oppress, ostracize, or marginalize others, when we engage in unjust, prejudicial, or biased behaviors, when we mistreat, malign, or take advantage of people, God is not pleased. Throughout the Old Testament, every time the Israelites were disobedient, broke their covenant with God, or relied on their own resources, knowledge, and strength, and especially when they mistreated others, God allowed them to be overtaken. Even though God allowed the Assyrians to overtake the people of Israel and to turn to, in order to turn them back to God, the Assyrians' aggression towards the people of God and the destruction of Israel exceeded what God intended. The Assyrian king mistakenly thought that he was in control of his military effort and he planned to utterly destroy God's people, to wipe them off the face of the earth. And more importantly, the Assyrian king's arrogance was an egregious affront to God, as he claimed all power as his own and declared, by the strength of my hand and by my wisdom and understanding, I have overcome the people of God. God addresses the Assyrian king's arrogance, pronouncing, shall the ax vault itself over the one who wields it? Or shall the saw magnify itself against the one who handles it? The Assyrian king and his army were merely instruments used to effectuate God's plans. However, much like us, they went rogue. And they had their own plans and designs, which were not ordained by or the will of God. God pronounces punishment upon the Assyrian king, declaring, a wasting sickness upon his soldiers, and like thorns and briars, the Assyrian soldiers, forest, and fruitful lands would be destroyed by fire. 
This is a warning to all people in all generations. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and that claiming God's way, work, or glory as our own has consequences. When God calls us to serve in any capacity, all glory, honor, and recognition belong to God and God alone. We are merely God's instruments. However, sometimes we feel ourselves and feel that, you know, we're responsible for, responsible for the outcomes when serving God and one another. Beloved, God is not surprised when things don't go as we planned. And God knows the ending even before we begin. And even and especially when we feel we have failed and have wasted time, God's plan is to give us a future with hope. There is no wasted time in God. There is no wasted deliberation in God. There is no failure in God. Everything, good, bad, and indifferent, all work together for the good of them who love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. Isaiah prophesied that Assyria would fall like a tree and would never sprout again, and that although the house of David is currently falling like a tree, a branch will sprout from its roots. A new socio-political order will spring up from the most unlikely and in an all-but-dead stump. All is not lost for God's people despite their current circumstances because from the house of David, a new king will be born and ascend and his reign will usher in a time of righteousness and peace. Isaiah's declaration of peace may seem hollow and meaningless to us today. After all, we are witnesses to devastating and destructive unceasing war in Ukraine and wars in other places all over the world. We are witnesses to unchecked violence that seems to be the order of the day in our communities. Even children are being gunned down senselessly. Natural disasters, erupting volcanoes, massive snow and rainstorms and accumulations, mudslides and tornadoes with deadly aftermaths, deadly and debilitating diseases are running rampant, unabashed Bold and unrepentant racism and hatred of LGBTQ individuals are openly exhibited and expressed. Too many people are living on a financial ledge and about to fall over without resources to supply their basic needs in this land of extravagance and extravagant waste. And instead of worshiping the God of our salvation, some worship, idolize, and put their hope and trust in their possessions, their personal wealth, their status, and yes, even in themselves. Isaiah declared, a little shoot, it's going to rise up from the roots of a dead branch. And a new type of king, empowered by God's spirit, committed to covenant and equity will reign, a king who judges with righteousness and ushers in justice for the poor and the meek, a king whose power will manifest unlike any other, for this king will be for the weak and the marginalized. This king will usher in a peaceable kingdom where, all, where there will be a reversal of predator and prey, a kingdom that originates from a stump as a shoot that grows flourishes and becomes a holy mountain of God where all the words of and in the words of Isaiah the wolf shall live with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the kid the calf the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them the cow and the bear shall graze their young shall lie together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox a nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. One commentator writes, though Isaiah speaks of a future when predator and prey will feast together, his vision can have transformative implications now if we allow the possibilities in our own lives. Transformative events, even when we are oblivious and unaware, do happen. I do not consider myself to be a photographer, but recently as I scrolled through pictures I had taken over the years, I found several pictures that always bring me joy and peace. 
pictures that transform my spirit and seem impossible when I come across this phenomena. Pictures of flowers growing out of sidewalk cracks. Flowers growing in the middle of paved parking lots. And flowers growing in dry gravel. The improbability of flowers growing in unlikely places transforms the most barren and fallow places into grounds of new life, hope, and promise. And remind me that even in hard and improbable places, circumstances, and even in times of despair, beautiful things can grow. Flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that adversaries can become advocates and enemies can become friends. Flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that little becomes much when dedicated to and in the hands of God. Flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that hatred, enmity, racism, and heterosexism can be eradicated when we open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to love as God loves unconditionally. Flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that a remnant is the foundation of a flourishing and growing community of believers. Did you hear me? A remnant is the foundation of a growing and flourishing community of believers. Flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that even in the midst of disappointment, devastation, death, and destruction, God is with us. And most of all, flowers growing in unlikely places remind me that as we await the Christ child, new life will emerge from an, an, in an all-but-dead stump because it is rooted and grounded in God. And the shoot that emerges, it is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting divine parent. And most of all, that shoot is the Prince of Peace. Amen.